You know, how we give to God changes our heart, changes the way we are. Now, that's interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we are discovering what the Bible says, not what everybody else says on television or everybody else tries to sell you on. But what does it say? We'll talk about it in five minutes' time. It's going to be very interesting. Corey is here with Ryan. Corey? I'm going to be reviewing the life and ministry of the prophet Ezekiel, as well as giving an overview of the book as we wrap it up. Ryan? Today, in preparation for the book of Daniel, which we begin tomorrow, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to Daniel from our very own Quick Study Bible. I love Daniel. I love this book, and I love... This is great. I'm going to meet Daniel in heaven. Uh, all right, go ahead, Jim. <laughs> My segment today is called, I'm so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Well, we're thankful for his word. Get his word out, open it up, and let's discover what he's saying to us right now and today. Ezekiel 46, 9 through 15. But when the people of the land come before the Lord on the appointed feast days, whoever enters by way of the north gate to worship shall go out by way of the south gate, and whoever enters by way of the south gate shall go out by way of the north gate. He shall not return by way of the gate through which he came, but shall go out through the opposite gate. The prince shall then be in their midst. When they go in, he shall go in, and when they go out, he shall go out. At the festivals and at the appointed feast days, the grain offering shall be an ephah for a bull, an ephah for a ram, as much as he wants to give for the lambs, and a hen of oil with every ephah. Now, when the prince makes a voluntary burnt offering or voluntary peace offerings to the Lord, the gate that faces toward the east shall then be opened for him, and he shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and after he goes out the gate shall be shut. You shall daily Make a burnt offering to the Lord of a lamb of the first year without blemish. You shall prepare it every morning. And you shall prepare a grain offering with it every morning, a sixth of an ephah, and a third of a hin of oil to moisten the fine flour. This grain offering is a perpetual ordinance to be made regularly to the Lord. Thus they shall prepare the lamb, the grain offering, and the oil, as a regular burnt offering every morning. Ezekiel chapter 46, verses 9 through 15. Ezekiel 46, Ezekiel 47, and Ezekiel chapter 48. This is what we read today. That the Lord speaks to the prophet Ezekiel, not unlike Moses, and the commands given are about how his people are to act and respond in giving. The way we give our tithes and our offerings in our churches today has largely watered down the reason why we give. If we give our offerings by dropping in a $20 bill every time we get a chance, that's really not giving in a meaningful way. When we give our tithes and our offerings, we should remember to thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, for all he's done for us. Now, this helps us to remember that our money, who we are, and everything we have is really his. The choices that we make as followers of Jesus Christ are direct result of his action in our lives. Now, think about that. So. When we give our offerings, it should not be so much about the empathy we feel towards a project that we're giving to, but about the blessings the Lord has given to us, even when we're in difficult times. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 46, 
God speaks to us through time, through time, and teaches us how to act and react when we are giving to the Lord. Now, isn't that something? Because giving has been so messed up these days because we just drop in 20 here, 20 there. What is the Lord's ministry? It's where you receive the word of God. You receive the Bible. Now take your word, or take your Bible guide, turn to the page. If you don't have one, why not call us? We'll send it to you. Um, this is just a way to tell, help you go through the Bible. It's got 40 pages in it, all dedicated to the month of August. And we have them every month. We send it out every month. So this is very, very important. Now, in chapter 46, the mariners uh, uh, of worship, rather the manner of, manner of worship, and uh, then in chapter, and also the price and the inheritance laws and how the offerings were prepared. Then in chapter 47, we read healing waters and trees. This is really something. And then borders of the land. And then in chapter 48, we read about the division of the land. This is really something. And the gates of the city in his name. So, Father, we pray today that you would help us as we focus carefully on this passage of scripture and we begin to read and learn what you've said in Jesus' name. And we said together, amen. Look at the first verse. This is interesting. 46 verse 9. But when the people of the land come before the Lord on the appointed feast days, there were feast days they would come. Whoever enters by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. And whoever enters by the way of the south gate shall go out by the way of the north gate. In other words, he shall not return by the way of the gate through which he came, but he shall go out through the opposite gate. Fascinating. God is, God is interesting. You know, giving to God changes us and how we think. We are changed when we give to God. We give to God because we love the Lord. Now, there's something about your money. Jesus said where your money is, that's where your heart is. So when we give to the Lord, our heart changes. We change. And there's, I could go into a lot of this. We don't have the time, but we can talk about this in the future. But when you give to God, your heart changes and it becomes more like God wants it to be. I want you to think about that because we know for a fact that less than 4% or 4% 4, 4 of the people in churches give. Ezekiel chapter 46, 10 to 12. Look at this. The prince shall then be in their midst. Who is this prince? Well, I don't know. Let's go forward. When they go in, he shall go in. And when they go out, he shall go out. At the festivals and at the appointed feast days, the grain of offering shall be an ephah for a bull and an ephah for a ram, as much as he wants to give for the lambs and a hen of oil with every ephah. Now, when the prince makes a voluntary burnt offering or a voluntary peace offering, burnt offering or peace offering to the Lord, the gate that faces towards the east shall then be opened for him. That's the eastern gate. And he shall prepare his burnt offerings and his peace offerings as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and after he goes out, the gate shall be shut. Now, this brings me to the second point. Ezekiel is told that the prince is present when we worship by giving. Listen, we do not give to projects. We give to God. Do you understand that when everybody says, well, we got this project and we're feeding a billion people here. Hold on a minute. It's good to understand that you're helping people, but you give to God. Offerings and tithes give to where you receive the word of God. Do you know what the Bible says? Is the Bible teaching you? Then that's where you put your money. You give to where the Bible is being taught. Is the Bible being taught in your church? Good question, isn't it? Something we should think about. Now then, let's go to the last couple of verses because this is good. You shall daily make a burnt offering to the Lord of a lamb of the first year without blemish. You shall prepare every morning, prepare it every morning, and you shall prepare a grain offering with every morning, 
a sixth of an ephah and a third of a hen of oil to moisten the fine flour. This grain offering is a perpetual ordinance to be made regularly to the Lord. Regularly. Thus, they shall prepare the lamb, the grain offering, and the oil as a regular burnt offering every single morning. That's important. The third point, giving to God is a real part of our eternal life. Giving is a joy. And God loves a cheerful giver. By the way, that's in the scripture too. Now, we live in New Testament times, so we don't have live animals that we sacrifice and all of that. The principles of giving are still the same. Giving changes us. Giving is important, part of worship, to change our souls, to move towards God. I, I can't tell you how important that is. You know, we need to hear that because as we give to whatever project the Holy Spirit tells us is His project, we need to hear that. Giving to God's projects is very, very important. The other thing we need to remember is that it's real. This is a real part of God. You know, it's not Christ, become a Christian and go home and sit for the rest of your life and in the corner and watch television. That's not what it is. Beloved, when we see things happening in our world, we need to say, Lord, how do you want me to respond? How do you want me to move? Giving can be an action. It can be you giving your time. It can be you giving some of your talent, whatever. But you need to pay attention to giving because it is so important. And I want to pray because we have to. Lord, I pray today that somehow your word would speak to people. Help us to learn how to give today. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. Now, as we finish up the book of Ezekiel today, I want to take some time to reflect over what it is that we've read. So we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at the prophet Ezekiel's life and ministry, some of the peculiarities of his book, the book of Ezekiel, and then kind of give an overarching structure uh, of the book itself. Take a look. The prophet Ezekiel has left us with 48 chapters of his authored prophecies in the book of Ezekiel. This biblical book contains visions, prophetic actions, divine intervention, and direct specific dated prophecies. It seems that for Ezekiel, it was important that future generations would be able to look back at his prophecies, know when he gave them, and therefore know by their fulfillment that God's word was true. Amazingly, thanks to excavated Babylonian records, very precise dates for these dated messages and even events in Ezekiel's life are known. For example, we're able to know from the scriptures that Ezekiel was a part of the wave of exiles that traveled to Babylon shortly after the reign of Jehoiakim, who had rebelled as a vassal king against Babylon. When Jehoiakim died, his 18-year-old son Jehoiachin was left with the aftermath of an invading Babylonian army. He surrendered and went into exile along with a large number of Judeans. In Jehoiachin's stead, Babylon appointed Zedekiah as the next and turns out final king of Judah. This wave of Babylonian exile occurred in 597 BC, a full 10 years before the fall of Jerusalem. Ezekiel was called as a prophet four years after going into exile in 593 BC. More specifically, it was likely July 13th, 593 BC. And then a large chunk of Ezekiel's prophecies from chapters 1 to 24 deal with the impending doom of Jerusalem, the temple, and Judah as a whole. We're told that beyond Ezekiel being called as a prophet of God, he was also a priest from the line of Zadok, which goes a long way in explaining why he was one of the more upper-class Judeans that was exiled first. 
It also seems very appropriate that God would use a priest to both announce the decommissioning of the temple in Jerusalem and foretell of its future recommissioning. Today, there are many different interpretations of Ezekiel's later prophecies. For our reference, the first 24 chapters deal with the judgment of Judah and Jerusalem, typified in the destruction of the temple. Then chapters 25 to 32 deal with judgments against various foreign nations. And then the remaining chapters, 33 to 48, all deal with the future hope of Jerusalem, its restoration as God's city and temple bearer. The various interpretations of Ezekiel's visions generally concern his apocalyptic passages and passages that deal with a restored Jerusalem and Israel. However, it's important to first take away the general message. Though God judges, there will also be a restoration. God's ultimately victorious over evil. Righteousness will prevail and he will dwell with his people. So really, I just want to bring you some encouragement as we've read through the book of Ezekiel. If you have gotten to this end of Ezekiel and you're really struggling to figure out what it means, you're, you're kind of wading through all the details, I want to bring an encouragement to you where you may not be able to understand, none of us may be able to fully understand all of the details of Ezekiel, all of, of all of Ezekiel's prophecies, but we can understand the greater picture. We can understand the big picture that Ezekiel is prophesying for us and that God is giving to us through, which is after judgment, there is restoration and there will be restoration. So it's really handy when we're, you know, to not get stuck in the weeds, to not get really drowned out there, to keep in mind uh, this, this bigger picture of God's restoration. I think it's important. That's really good, Corey. Let's not get stuck in the weeds with, you know, because mm -hmm. this is, in the world today and everything else, everybody gets stuck. You know, this is happening and that's yeah. happening and this is happening. Yeah. But let's remember God has a plan and the plan is restoration. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really important. Thank you for that. Very mm -hmm. good. Brian? All right. Well, tomorrow we begin the book of Daniel. So I thought today it would be good if I were to give you a little bit of an introduction to prepare us. And I'm going to be reading from our very own Quick Study Bible. And if you have your copy, turn to page 1106 and you can read along. And it says, during his long life, Daniel received many compliments. Even as a young man, he was known for his wisdom. A popular proverb in those days was, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. That's from Ezekiel 28.3. Tradition says Daniel taught two Persian kings the knowledge of the true God. And it is believed that Zoroaster of the ancient Persian uh, religion was a fictitious character drawn from the image of Daniel. Some Asiatic peoples claim that Daniel invented geometry. The historian Josephus notes that Daniel was the architect who masterminded the building of the famous Susa Tower in Persia, where all their kings are enshrined. In spite of all these accolades, Daniel's highest compliment came from the angel Gabriel. Sent in answer to Daniel's prayers, Gabriel twice called him greatly beloved. The book of Daniel is broken into two sections and is written in two different languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. Some critics say this disproves Daniel's authorship. However, the simple fact is that Daniel was both an Israelite and a member of Babylon's court. He would naturally use Aramaic, the diplomatic dialect, and the Hebrew tongue of his mother country. Such attempts are made to discredit Daniel because of his dynamic prophecies concerning the coming Christ detailed in chapter 9. The most famous part of Daniel is the incident of Daniel in the lion's den, familiar to most every Sunday school student. Daniel's book literally breathes stories of God's protection and direction. By reading Daniel, one can see how closely God hovers over those who love him and how he returns that love in many different ways. May we too strive to be greatly beloved by our God. The songwriter says, all the talents I have, I have laid at thy feet. Thy approval shall be my reward. Now, that's that's interesting. I'm written by my father. That's right. Um, yeah. And my father uh, passed away uh, 12 years ago. But uh, it's, you know, he did a lot of work on Daniel. And I love Daniel. Daniel is just an awesome guy. 
But it's important to remember that his book is written in the two languages. Mm -hmm. And Daniel would have been very good at both languages and probably some other languages. Yeah, absolutely. Because he served in the Babylonian court, uh, you know, coming from Israel. And but then he also ended up serving in the Persian courts because he was adopted by the Persian kings when they walked in without conflict and took yeah. it over. That's where we get the saying, the writing on the wall. Yeah. But uh, so he's had, here's a man who's had different experiences in the culture, but the culture that really got him was timeless culture. When he starts seeing the visions of what God is going to do. And it, in, in his word, it says, uh, I, Daniel became sick. I became weary in hearing this and I couldn't understand it. Very interesting. Yeah, totally. totally. He was fascinating, he was a, fascinating prophet. Because he was accelerated beyond his existence and suddenly he saw things that were so far beyond them that he just had trouble. And that's what would happen with us if the Holy Spirit revealed to us, like to Daniel, everything. We'd get sick. And John is another one. Uh, John who wrote the book of Revelation, which we'll get to near the end of the year. Yeah. Yep. And, Very good. And there's also literary devices going on in Daniel, which is my segment tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Oh, I can't wait for that. <laughs> All right. Literary devices. That'll be good. Uh, okay, very good. Janice? Well, I think that, um, you know, there was a few days ago, Corey, that you made a very special announcement. And <laughs> I think that it would warrant, we have time left here before my segment, to let Corey make a very special announcement. Now, of course, uh, the day that we're taping this program, mm -hmm. this is for August the 24th, but we're actually taping this at the end of July. Yes. So, I, well, I'm just going to throw it over to Corey and let her explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll explain why the timing is so important. Because if you missed the announcement a few days ago, it's just that I know the table's here. So it can be kind of hard to tell. I've had some people go, is she, isn't she? Yes, I am expecting my third child. So um, they are supposed to arrive soon. When we're taping this again, it's end of July. So I'm about four weeks in advance right now. But currently I'm at 34 weeks of the 40 weeks. So we'll see. We'll see. Who knows yes. what could happen in four weeks from now. Exactly. But, but yes, so I will be pretty soon on the program. You won't see me for a few months, but then I'll be back. So I'm going to go on a short maternity leave to recover and to get to know the little little person. So, and we're very excited. Yeah. So, excited. so you're, you're not leaving the program. No, you, not for good. Just yeah. for just for a few months. <laughs> okay, good. That's excellent. Uh, and, and I can't wait to see this one. This mm -hmm. is going to be this, number three. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see this one. So anyway, there you go. A boy. That's right. Well, <laughs> yep. Yeah. There yeah, we go. Yeah, there, we'll, see. Right. There, we'll see. We'll see. We'll <laughs> see. Well, you know, I titled this today, So Thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I truly, truly, truly am. And every time I begin to read through the Old Testament and read through the rituals of what the people were required to do through the priests, I'm so thankful for the work on the cross that Jesus Christ did for us. You know, and as we look at uh, chapter 46 of Ezekiel, we see the manner of worship. And he begins to write all of the things that the people need to do with the burnt offerings and the measurement of the offerings and the, and the for so many ephahs, it would be a hen of oil or fine flour. And you go through all these things and you think, my goodness, how do you even keep all of that straight? And so it's just, Rod, another reminder to me of the beautiful work that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. He was the only one that have, could have given his life and be that perfect sacrifice, that sacrifice once and for all for you and for me. And so um, for further reading, Hebrews chapter 10 is a really wonderful uh, reminder and a teaching of really the fulfillment of what Jesus did. And Hebrews 10, verse 10, so that's easy to remember. Hebrews 10, verse 10 says this, By that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that's really, truly impressive when you see everything that uh, is being foreshadowed here. As I mentioned, you know, a couple of days ago, and I think I'm going to be talking about it again tomorrow. Um, all of the things that the priests had to do um, for the people, for the people of God, that now it's not on the priests, mm. it's through the work 
that Jesus Christ did on the cross. I think it's important also to remember that Hebrews in the New Testament uh, reflects a lot of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one example. Reading Hebrews 10, 10 is an excellent example. Of what you've talked the Bible is connected. And uh, we need to remember, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm in the New Testament. I don't mm -hmm. believe in the Old Testament. And, and I often say to them, well, no, you, it's the Bible, just like the New Testament is. And that's why we spend all this time going to the New Testament. We're in the book of the 12 right mm -hmm. now. Well, we're not in the book of the 12, we're in the majors, but we're the, we'll be in the book of the 12 soon, uh, the 12 prophets. And I think that we need to remember that God has a reason for placing this here. And you covered it very well. Well, and I think what a shame that it is. I mean, we wouldn't go to the library and take out a book that looks very interesting or maybe that doesn't look interesting even, but we wouldn't start in the middle or we wouldn't just read the end. I know that some people read the end of the book and then they go to the beginning and they read through. I don't like to do that. I like to work my way through. But what a shame it would be to just pick up a book and read it from part way, because you may not be able to understand, and, you, and in fact, you wouldn't be able to fully understand and grasp the entire book, what the author intended for you to know. So it's the very same thing. It, it hurts my heart when I hear people say, well, I, I don't like the Old Testament. I, I don't think we need to read the Old Testament because I think they're missing out on an awful lot. And that's why here on this program, we have dedicated ourselves to read not just portions of the Bible. Now, you may not be able to read the whole Bible all the way through, and that's okay because Corey and her husband even do a recap on the weekends to help you to get caught up. But even if you begin with portions, but don't just get stuck in one spot. Don't just get stuck in Revelation. Carry or on. Don't just get stuck in the Psalms because you love them or Proverbs because it gives good advice, or in Genesis because it talks about creation, but begin there and work your way through. And I'm telling you, it makes a difference in your life. It does, and very soon, we're gonna get into September, and very soon, now I'm, we're in July, but I'm talking, or in August, but I'm talking about <laughs> September. And uh, September is dealing with the rest of the prophets, and then we're into the New Testament, and things change. And as they change, we'll see the times in which we live. So keep that in mind. And also remember this, that giving doesn't change. The attitude towards giving doesn't change. The precepts have changed. We don't sacrifice animals anymore, but giving doesn't change.